This is Big Bass University, the leading authority in outdoor educational programming. Hi, I'm Steve Horvath, host of Delaware Valley Outdoors. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite lakes. It's Lake Hepatcong in northern New Jersey. Lake Hepatcong is New Jersey's largest lake. It's over 2,500 acres in size. It's located conveniently right off of Route 80 for people coming from anywhere in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. The easiest exit to access the lake is the Howard Boulevard exit. The lake is in both Morris and Sussex counties. The lake was impounded in 1750. It was originally two small lakes. When a dam was built, it flooded both of them to form the lake that we now know as Lake Hepatcon. There's a small dam on the Musconnectong River. This dam is also the flood control and the water level control for the lake. The lake has a 30 mile an hour speed limit which is very strictly enforced. There are officers out there with radar guns on the weekends. The lake has several arms. The better known arms of the lake are River Styx, Woodport, Henderson, and Byram. Every year, the water level is drawn down in Lake Hepatcong for actual maintenance of docks. It starts in October and is generally back to full pool sometime around early April. The drawdown can be anywhere from 23 to 30 inches. Every five years, the lake is drawn down to a five-year low, which is as much as five feet. Now, when the water is drawn down this far, it can make navigation very dangerous, but if you go out in a smaller boat, you stay in the deeper areas of the lake, you can really find a lot of structures that you would never know even existed. The fish in Lake Apakong are just about everything you can ever imagine. There are largemouth bass up to seven pounds. The lake has really come on in recent years with very large muskie over 40 inches. There are tons and tons of pickerel in the lake, this being a grass lake. Some of these pickerel are over five pounds and even larger. There are hybrid stripers that a lot of anglers target at night or in very deep water. The lake has a very good panfish population. It's well known for its numbers of rock bass, yellow perch, and crappie. The main food item in the lake is the lake owlwife. There are some people that actually harvest them to sell them for bait in the lake, and they make a fine food fish for all the bigger predators. Now, Lake Hepatcong has got lots of weeds or vegetation. It's got milfoil that grows in the shallows and up to a depth of about eight or nine feet. As you'll notice, you can see the sun shining in, and this is also a photo of milfoil. Milfoil tends to stand straight up and grow toward the surface when possible. This slide shows a back shoreline that has been completely inundated in milfoil. The milfoil is great for bass and it's great for fishing, but it's not really good for pleasure boat traffic. The weeds can actually come up and choke out areas of the lake and for that reason, they actually control the weeds in the lake. Now, there are several ways of controlling weeds. You can poison them with sprays and powders, or you can harvest. On Lake Apakong, they use grass harvesters to a large extent. As you can see, this gentleman is running the grass harvester. It's pulling up pads and grass, and it's almost like a lawnmower. It's set to a certain depth. They can go into a cove that can be completely weed choked, and by the time they're done, there are no weeds at all. What does this do for the fishing? It changes it. They dump out the weeds and it changes the fishing. Now, to understand weeds and weed fishing, you need to know some of the terminology. Weed lines, okay? What is a weed line? Well, a weed line has defined edges. 
It's not a large mass of weeds. It's actually a line that goes from one depth to another. And bass are located in different areas. The first area is the inside weed edge. Now this is the edge between the actual weeds and the dry shoreline. That's your inside edge. It's a key area. Next you have in the weeds. Bass will sometimes get buried in the center of the weeds if they're not active, or they'll be over top of those weeds. Now, as you can see, your boat position is a little bit different. In this case, the angler is actually casting across the weeds when the fish are in the grass. Then you have the outside edge. Now this edge is either a hard edge where it just the grass actually stops when the water drops off very deep, or in the case where it's a much shallower taper, the grass will actually taper out. But the outside edge is a good place to find fish that are out feeding on schools of bait fish. If you notice, this angler has the boat, so they're on the edge of the weeds and they're casting down the weeds to fish the outside edge of the weed line. Now, what's a weed flat? Basically, as you can see from the picture, a weed flat is a large flat area that may be a large expanse of weeds. It could be the size of your backyard, a size of a football field. There are several weed beds that literally go for a mile on Lake Hepatcong. They all demand different fishing techniques. Now let's take a look at the way fish position in reference to the weeds. Okay. Fish can be in different locations depending on their feeding mode. Okay, as you can see, this fish is close to the shoreline, over top of the edge of the weeds. This is an active fish. This fish is out in, say, a weed flat near a point or other structure. This fish is down in the grass. This is a fish that is going to need a little coaxing to bite. You may need to drop straight down on this fish to get it to eat. Now, there are different baits that we use for bass fishing in weeds. Now, they come in two categories. One is search baits. A great search bait is the jerk bait. You'll notice there are three distinct types of jerk baits on this screen. Each one has its own place. The top one is your floating rapala. Notice I said rapala, that's how it's spelled, that's how it's said. The floating rapala is a great bait in springtime when the fish are getting ready to go on their beds. It's a great time after they've done bedding in the summer. And it also runs over top of the weeds. It's fished with a jerk pause motion. The second bait you see there in the center is a Lucky Craft Pointer. It's a suspending jerk bait. It's fished in deeper areas generally in colder weather, okay? This is jerk down and let the sit to suspend. It will dive five to six feet deep. The last bait is a soft jerk bait. This jerk bait can be fished in heavy grass. It can be fished over top of grass. It's Texas rigged. The most important thing that we need to know about these jerk baits is jerk baits, as the category of search baits goes, they cover a good amount of water in a short amount of time. They may not be the lure to catch all the fish on for that day, but they're an excellent lure to find fish. Then we go to rattle baits. Okay, what we're looking at is a rattle trap. Rattle trap type baits are great baits for a lot of different times of the year. There are two keys to fishing a rattle bait. Number one, you need the rattle bait to get down to the edge of the grass and actually tick the top of the grass and you need to pull it out of the grass. You don't want it to bog down with grass. You don't want it to go up to the surface. Okay, that's point number one. The second key is varying the lure weight and the line size to do that. Your rattle baits will run deeper on smaller diameter, lighter pound test line. That means on 10 pound test line, a quarter ounce rattle bait will run deeper than the same bait on a 20 pound line. So you can change line test 
and lure size to get to the right depth. And rattle baits are an excellent search bait. Next bait is a spinner bait. Spinner baits come in all shapes, sizes, colors, blade designs, and we're going to take a look at this one in particular. Why? Because as a weedy lake, a willow leaf blade is a very good blade to have on a spinner bait. The willow leaf blade turns in a very tight radius. It doesn't tend to get choked up with grass very easily. Also, you'll notice the spinner bait is in white. I use white or a white type of clear bait fish finish in this lake. That's the only color I use except at night when I go to black. Spinner baits are a great bait any time of the year. They really shine, they really shine in spring and fall. Cleanup lures. What's a cleanup lure? Well, cleanup lures are pretty much, to me, they start with soft plastics. Soft plastic is fished slower. It's fished down into the cover. What an angler does is they go over an area, they'll find fish, they'll catch a few. Now you want to go back through that area and catch the fish that aren't as active. Now we have a tube on the left, very popular lure, darker colors and tubes. You want blacks and green pumpkins and pumpkins, June bug, colors like that. Then we have our creature baits in the center. Creature baits are another great bait. They add a lot of bulk. They're quite weedless. They can be fished through the grass. Then we have our finesse worms, our slider worm, and our other shaky type worm, or senko worm. Both of them are fished slow, generally not fished with a whole lot of weight. It's a finesse presentation, and it's also a great lure to throw back to a fish that's already tried to eat a search bait, but wasn't hooked. The next type of cleanup lure we're going to look at is the weedless jig. Now, weedless jigs are really a great big fish lure. You will at times catch less fish on them, especially less smaller fish, but your average size will be bigger. Again, we go with colors blacks, black and blues, your greens, your browns. They imitate crayfish that are in the lake. They imitate bluegills that are in the lake. They imitate a lot of different things. These lures are generally fished either vertically or on short casts in heavy cover. Now, let's take a look at some of the other cover that's in the lake, other than weeds. What are they? They're boat docks and boat houses. Lake Hepatcon has got a billion of them, and the most common thing that they provide is shade. They provide shade from the sun, which gives the bass a nice dark spot for ambush. The other thing it does is it gives them overhead cover. Even though bass and other large fish are predators, at one time they were prey. Large birds like ospreys and, and herons and stuff like that eat them from above so they feel safe. The other thing is beyond the shade, it gives you vertical cover, which there's not a lot of. The actual pilings and posts provide vertical cover for bass to hang around. Now, boat docks and boat houses do have some fringe benefits. The first one is they grow slime. Now, why am I even concerned with slime? It gets all over my line and my lure and stuff. Well, slime is the basis of the food chain. That keeps the bait fish around the dock and draws the bass. The second thing around the dock is many of them have grass around the docks. But what happens is when there's a boat moored against the dock and the boat is is run. It chops up the grass and creates a, a cave in the grass next to the dock. So that's another fringe benefit. The last thing is to fish up under the docks. Many areas are hard to reach. The more accurate caster can get way up under the dock and catch fish that, well, frankly, most people never even get to. Now, boat docks and boat houses, they have some key locations. The first key location we're going to look at is up close to the bank, up under the dock. It's shady. It offers overhead cover. The second location is going to be anywhere there's a swimming ladder. Generally, the water is deeper, and the ladder has vertical cover for the fish. The next spot, and it's actually two spots, is the 
outside corners of the dock. As you can see, there are, are two outside corners, one on the left, one on the right. These are also key locations. A bass will sit up under the dock in the shade looking out into the sun. The last spot is where you have that boat tied to the dock. Remember, there's a grass cave there from the motor going in and out and cutting the grass. Also, between that boat and the dock, there's shade. It's a great spot to cast if you can get a bait up in there. Now, Lake Apacon has literally thousands of boat docks and boat houses to fish. A lot of times I ask myself, where do I even start? How do I choose? Well, in this picture, we have two boat houses that on the surface look similar, but have one startling difference. What's the difference? Well, one boat house has the door open and the other one has the door closed. While you might look at the one with the door open and say, well, you know, anybody can cast in there. Actually, that'll let you get a lure farther back in there. There are more places you can access. You take a look at the other boathouse. The door is closed. If the door is closed to the point where you can't get a lure up in there, that area of the boat dock is unfishable. But if it's closed to within six inches of the water and you can skip your lure back in there, you're basically skipping your lure into a cave of wonders. There's shade, there's cover, there's food, and it's a great place to catch a bass. But we also need to know when fish are in different areas of the lake and how to target them. So let's take a look at the seasonal movements of bass. As you can see, we're looking at the river sticks arm of the lake. During ice out, when the period is as the ice melts and it's first off the lake, you're going to find the fish out toward the main lake part of the area. They're going to be out on the main points, the steeper shorelines. There will still be a few fish up in the shallows, but most of the fish are waiting to move up into the actual river sticks arm to spawn. Now, we get into the spring spawning migration. Now, the bass have already started to move up. They're migrating toward the back. You'll see that there's a bridge going over the river sticks. That's an excellent place to start. It gives you overhead cover. There's some grass. There's a transition from the main lake to the back cove. The areas around that bridge and the vertical cover of the bridge are a great, uh, basically a, a staging area. Let's take a look at what happens next. The fish are going to spawn. Where are they going to spawn? They're going to spawn way up in that cove in the dark blue colored water that you see. And the heavy spawn is going to be up at the ends, the shallowest, the sandiest, most protected areas. The wind doesn't blow hard there. The water doesn't get rough. It's an ideal spawning area. Now, after the bass spawn, you're going to see the complete opposite. The fish are now going to move out to the points that are in the back and they're going to move toward the bridge and they're going to move back out toward the main lake. After that, you get into the summertime. Now, in the summertime, there are still some fish up shallow. There are always a few fish up shallow, but a good amount of them are in the offshore weed beds, out near the points, out in the 10 to 12 feet of water. That is the key to summertime fishing. Now, as we move into fall, again, the bass are going to reverse. The, the shad or owl wives or whatever you want to call them go into the shallower areas of the lake to feed on the plankton and stuff like that. The bass follow them. They may not follow them all the way to the very backs of the coves, but they will make a real movement up into the coves. Now, let's take a look at one spot. This is spot 53 out of 56 spots that are on our DVD. Now, as you can see, you have the GPS coordinates here, okay? Spot number 53 is King's Cove. Now, there's a reason why I picked King's Cove, okay? King's Cove has deeper water, and it's an area where bass will spend most of the year, okay? Let's take a look at ice out. As you'll notice, you don't see any weeds in our picture. There aren't a lot of weeds. Most of the weeds are dead. There will, however, be some clumps of dead grass or grass that's just starting to grow after ice out as it warms up. Now, 
these fish are going to be in the eight to nine foot of water area just before they start their spring spawning migration. As the spawning migration begins, you'll see that the grass has now grown up. With the grass grown up, the fish have more cover, they can move shallower, and with the spawn, they will move even closer to the bank. And they'll be in that blue area between the weeds and the bank, along the docks and places like that. In post-spawn, the fish will move back out toward the deeper weeds, and we're going to target them with, with deeper baits. And what happens now is you concentrate on the deep weeds, the patchy weeds, areas like that. Now, we get into summer. Most of the time in the summer, we're really not going to think a whole lot about those shallower weeds. We're going to stay in those deep weeds, 9 to 10 feet, and these fish are going to spend a lot of their time out there. Lots of times they'll be lethargic. You're going to have to fish a lot of this grass, probably with a search bait, get a bite or two, and then you're going to switch over to your cleanup lures, your worms, your jigs, and that's where you'll catch the actual concentrations of bass in this cove. Now, if we have to go back and, and recap what we covered, okay, the first thing that you need to know about any fish, whether it's a bass, a bluegill, a perch, a muskie, any of it, they have seasonal movements. They have preferred water temperatures and depths when they move, and they're at it certain types of the year. When those fish are there, how those fish are there, what are they feeding on, Okay, the next thing you need to do is you need to be able to understand the cover and how those fish relate to it. Hybrid stripers will not be found thick in the grass. You're not going to bounce a three quarter ounce jig through a mat of grass fishing for hybrid stripers. You need to know that they suspend out away from the grass edges. They suspend off the humps. They're in open water with bait fish. Just the opposite's true with your bass species. They're closer to cover. They're buried in the cover. They're, they're feeding right at dawn and dark. You need to know what lure selection you need to have so that you can target those fish. If I'm going hybrid striper fishing, if I'm going at night, I'm going to have poppers. I'm going to have big swimming plugs. I'm going to have stuff like that. I'm going to be trolling live bait. If I'm largemouth fishing in the summer, I'm going to be having soft plastics and spinner baits and stuff like that tied on. I'm going to fish shallow. If I'm musky fishing, I'm going to be covering a lot of water. There's not muskies all over the lake. So you're going to use lures like big swim baits, great big spinners. Once you understand those things, you'll catch a lot more fish in Lake Hepatcom. Now, the important thing is that you get this DVD. And why do you want this DVD? We give you 56 hot spots in a lake. These are my own spots that I fish. We give you descriptions of the spots. We recommend tackle. And we give you launch ramp locations so you're not tied down to one launch ramp. Hey, I'm Steve Horvath. I'll see you on the water. For more seminars like this one, go to BigBassUniversity.com.